Night gathers, and now our podcast begins. It shall not end until we're done talking. We are the princes that were promised. Welcome to the princes that were promised. It's me, it's Shawnee Wan, and joining me, as always, the warden of Nassau County, supreme leader of all spoilers, Probably the world's biggest Jon Snow fan. It's John. Don't be up there. I got what about three thousand off of the merchandise. How fast? <laughs> <laughs> Do you have two long claws? Am I mistaken? Oh, I, no, I got two long claws, book and TV version. And what are the main? I know you've told me before, and this isn't the Jon Snow episode, but just out of curiosity, what are the differences? They're made by the same manufacturer, right? They're both Valyrian steel swords. Yeah, being the name of, of the is, company. Yeah, one of them is just the, the the show one I have is the stainless steel one because the Damascus one for the show just costs too much money. Since I had the Damascus book version that cost me an arm and a leg, I just thought I had to watch the penny someplace, so mm-hmm. I had to choose a stainless steel one. So that's the difference right there. Um, the book version one's a little bit bigger. Okay. Which some people have complained about because it's almost on par as the size of uh, ice, which it shouldn't be. No, definitely not. And just the pummels are a little bit different where the TV show one has probably a little more of a realistic ghost face to it a little bit. A little more of a, as the book version is a little more... Um, like detailed? Uh, not detailed. Not as realistic wolf. Okay. You can see the difference of uh, five years. Okay. But the book went away as laser around my red, the top of my bed. You said Damascus, is that the name of the people that made the book version sword? No, that's just the, the type of sword. Oh, okay. Like, okay. it's like the way it's cut, like the way the, uh, the metal is. Okay. It's cool things to have, dude. I've always wanted to get an ice. Yeah. The ice book version one, the handle of, it, of that all is so awesome. It's like this white handling and all that. The show one, I, I didn't like the show one. I thought the show was just too... I don't know, dull. Yeah, it was it was just like a real big sword. That's unfortunate too, because every time you do an image search on Google for ice, the sword from A Song of Ice and Fire, you usually just get a picture of Sean Bean in Winter is Coming with... Anyway, that's our spiel on Valyrian Steel Swords. Today, we're discussing the television adaptation of my favorite character in A Song of Ice and Fire, who is not my favorite character in Game of Thrones. He's up there. But he's not my favorite character in Game of Thrones. Sir Jamie Lannister. No longer the Lord Commander of the King's Guard. Oh, actually, is he? Did Cersei reinstate him as Lord Commander of the King's Guard? I don't think no, I think she I just think abolished so. it. She just has the, the mountain. Yeah. That's all she needs. But Jamie Lannister, who he's my favorite character in A Song of Ice and Fire, and he has been so since my first read through of A Storm of Swords. John, I want to say, I'm not positive, but I want to say that you have grown to appreciate Jamie more as time goes on. Am I correct in saying that? That is that is correct. This climax with a text I got from you, I don't know how long ago, maybe not too weeks. long ago, yeah, yeah, a couple, a couple weeks, weeks, in which you said Jamie Lannister is now in your top, was it top five or top three? Top five. I'm confident he'll get to the top three. I don't know. That'd be very tough. You got top three is you, you, you got John. You got Ned. Those are like unmovable. Father is than his biological father. Oh, <laughs> uh, Rhaegar, yeah. Okay. But what is it about Jamie that has, in recent times, pushed the needle, so to speak, made him more of a favorite of yours? I was thinking about this the other day, and uh, where we leave off with him in the book is kind of his stance where we're leaving off with him in the show, where he's not obeying Cersei's orders. Yes. Okay. So I'm not sure, man, the book is he still going to go back to Cersei one more time until he finally says, the hell with it? I don't think so. Not to get too deep into the book, but where we leave him in the book is Cersei has written to him asking him to be her champion in her trial against the Faith of the Seven. And he took the letter, threw it into the fire, and then Brienne shows up and he chooses to go with her mm-hmm. to rescue, she says, Arya, or was it Sansa? Whichever is Stark. Uh, Sansa. It was Sansa, right? Yeah. 
but he chooses to go and honor the vow he made to Catelyn instead of save his sister's life, knowing full well that it may cost his sister her life. It's different, but I almost feel like it's the same. You know, it's just that same character arc. Yeah, yeah. Nikolai Castlewalder is one of my favorites on the show. Now I don't know why in the show you say he's not your favorite character on the show. And maybe it's because you're so invested in his book character. You, you know, the differences in his character may pop up. Mm-hmm. But I just love Nikolai Castlewalder's performance as Jamie Lasser. That's one of the reasons why I think I've grown to like Jamie. Okay, I think it's fair to say that. I think. Costa Waldo, I think he is a good representation of the face turn of Jamie's character arc where it ends up. But I think that he's too likable of a actor, too likable of a guy, Costa Waldo, that I think that the villain Jamie, not that he didn't do a good job with it. I just don't think that he, maybe it's the writing, maybe it's just the way he looks and his charisma. I don't think it's as well done as... Redemption, Jamie. I think me and the show, I mean, this is season one. And I'm sure they weren't trying to, at that point, trying to add extra scenes. Mm-hmm. But looking back on it, maybe just seeing one more battle with a full arm Jamie, mm-hmm. a made up scene. Right. To strike fear in people, to how good he was with the sword. Because, like in the books, we get, you get that sense of fear with Jamie Lannister. It's not like he had a whole lot of sword fighting in the books. In fact, that one scene with Ned where he duels with Ned, that right. never happens in the, in, in a song of his fire. so many people talk about him that you get that fear. In the show, we've talked about this before, you need, sometimes you need visualizations. Yeah. If they could have just made a scene up there where he's on the field battling, he's got, you know, and, he, and he's just taking up people left and right. And then all of a sudden, then you cut to the scene with Tyrion Lannister where he has his trial, and he's like, I call my brother. And they're like, oh, no, 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 we're not doing no, that. We, you know? we knew you were going to call your brother. Yeah. He ain't <laughs> I wish we would have seen something like that. I was banking on, because that's it's the same way it functions in A Storm of Swords, his duel with Brienne of Tarth. That sword fight, the way it was in A Storm of Swords, really showcases Jamie's ability, because he'd been in chains for so long. He was so weak from being in the dungeons of River Run, and he hadn't held a sword in so long. Here's Brienne, who won that melee for King Renly and killed a couple of Renly's knights, a couple of the Rainbow Guard, I believe at least one member of the Rainbow Guard, before her and Catelyn's flight away from whatever the hell castle they're at in the south in the books. So you know that Brienne is, is a very formidable opponent, despite her being a woman. So that fight Brienne even comments on it in A Feast for Crows that she didn't think she would beat him. And it was amazing how how weak he was, how he'd been chained. That was the only reason that she was able to even stand with him. Otherwise, he would have made short work of her. Like, that's how good he was. And you don't get anything like that. She's never said anything like that in the shows. Honestly, in season three, when they have that sword fight, it was a bit lackluster. Mm -hmm. I thought they could have done a better job with that. It was a bit lackluster and did not highlight I don't think it highlighted either one of their skills the way they're supposed to be. There's constraints, and, and I get it. I'll, I'll give it a pass. Yeah, I don't think that Jamie's abilities as a swordsman were realized in Game of Thrones. That being said, the arc that he goes through when he loses his hand in both cases, uh, well, not in both cases, but I think the, the Game of Thrones adaptation, I think it was pretty accurate as to what he went through in A Song of Ice and Fire. Like we said before, where he ends up, where he is at the end of season seven and where he is at the end of A Dance with Dragons. It's the same place, not physically, not location-wise, but it's the same place in his character arc. It's the same place in his head. I think he's cut Cersei out more, a little bit more so in A Song of Ice and Fire. I feel like in Game of Thrones, I mean, it's stupid to say he still loves his sister. He obviously, he loves his sister. But I feel like there is an outside possibility that he would side with his sister over the Westerosi alliance or mm-hmm. not, not that he will. I don't think he will, but I could see that more so in the Game of Thrones character than in the A Song of Ice and Fire character. I love a good redemption arc. I think normally in redemption arcs, you start with a character that is, it's like the Han Solo redemption arc. Not that Han Solo needed redemption, but. Well, well I think what you're doing right here is you're getting into an awesome segue to start a conversation off about Jane Lannister because some people have said, that he can never have redemption after what he did when we really first meet him and what he does to Bran. 
Right. It's, which is not true. It's just to execute it and to make, and not everybody has to, not everybody has to like him, but that person that did that to where he is now, it's got to be a believable journey. And that's all. Martin goes above and beyond making that a believable journey, but he actually makes, and I can't speak for you, but for me, he makes me not only understand why Jamie did it through Jamie's own words and through Jamie's actions and through what Jamie does, it makes me understand why Jamie did that. Obviously, I don't approve of pushing kids out windows, but I understand. But he also he also regrets it. He, he also wishes he hadn't done it. Mm-hmm. There's a great meme. You know, I love a good meme. You love a meme. I love a good meme. I'm paraphrasing it, paraphrasing it a little bit. Coming through the uh, the, uh, the words of a guy who's trying to get his mother in the Game of Thrones, and he goes like, his mother asking him, you know, who his favorite character is after a couple seasons in. And the guy goes, well, <laughs> you remember that guy way back when, the first episode that pushed that nine-year-old out of the window? That guy. <laughs> <laughs> remember he was, he was fucking his sister, and he yeah, pushed the kid yeah. out the window, he's my favorite character. <laughs> it's a lot better, you know, it's a lot more crisper than the meme in itself. <laughs> Nikolai Costa-Waldo, for you, has helped sell you on the character of Jamie. Oh, with, with, without a doubt. Have you ever watched anything else by him? He's in, uh, curiosity? Uh, he's in Black Hawk Town. Oh, that's right, he is. Yeah, he's yeah, he's one of the, the guys who get shut down, one of the helicopters. It, it, you know, it's so funny when you see my when I first saw him, I thought he he looked just like the guy who plays Harvey Dent. What's his name? Aaron Eckhart. <laughs> Aaron Eckhart. Yeah, I'm like, I just thought this was like HBO's way of getting like a cheap Aaron Eckhart. Yeah. <laughs> Well, the timing would make sense, right? Because Aaron Eckhart was pretty big. Yeah. We couldn't get Adam Eckhart, so we're getting you this guy. He does look a little bit like Aaron Eckhart. He does. It's just that it's that shin. But as it turns out, I think I like him better than Adam Eckhart. He's been on the show since since day one, and I don't think I was ever disappointed at the performance he gave. I just think it was the way Jamie was represented. So when I say he's not my favorite character on the show, he's up there. He's definitely up there, but it's hard to not just get all in behind (laughs) Jon Snow. You got a good meme? <laughs> oh, look at some Jimmy Lasher memes. Cries about the Mad King burning women and children. Throws bread out a window. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's just that's just Jamie in a nutshell. I mean, yeah. just, you get the both sides of when he's around Cersei and when he's not around Cersei. It is rather ridiculous. The things he does, how opposite they are. The ideals he has now and the things mm-hmm. he's done in the past, it's like night and day. A couple of things people wrote about him. Andrew Romano, who's a reporter or entertainment reporter for the Daily Beast, Jamie wasn't a black and white bad guy for long. Game of Thrones spent season, I guess, three, four, five, transforming him into a pretty sympathetic character. Right. And they even went, we, we talked about before, they even went to great lengths to change the book line, quote, yes. The Red Wedding. You boys backed up why they did it. I always thought it wasn't as chilling, making it more of a plural thing, the last of the regards. I always thought it was more chilling the books. Jamie Lasser sends his regard because of what the conversation between Jamie and Roos mm-hmm. beforehand. Give Rob Stark my regards. I mean, I guess, you know, you'll, you know, the way you say it, you know, how they want to face turn him then. Well, it's, it's a harder process to make that transition from the guy you hate to the guy you either can stomach or you can respect or that you actually like. It's harder in TV to do that because you see things, they have to be black and white. You make an independent film, it can be open to interpretation. You can watch The Sopranos and people could be doing horrible things, but you identify with them. That's not the case here. Tony Soprano is a horrible, horrible man. He's a horrible, horrible man. But I love the character of Tony Soprano and I was always rooting for Tony Soprano and I wanted things to work out for Tony Soprano. And that's the beauty of television, but it can't be that way for Jamie. For his character, it starts off, you have to paint him in a picture that you don't like him. So then Mm -hmm. to change that picture, it can be gradual, but a situation like that where it probably could have still worked if Roos had the line, Jamie Lannister sends his regards. And you're right, it is a much better line. It's just more chilling. It's Mm -hmm. just- It's more hurtful to Rob Stark. Exactly. Being the last words he hears, more so than Lannister. Yeah, obviously, I'm at war war with the Lannisters. Obviously, you're betraying me because you're killing me right now. Right. Of course, it's them. For it to be Jamie who he had locked up, who his mother set free- And then it comes back to haunt him and to end him so soon after he's freed. It's like salt in the wound of Rob Stark. But the 
the thing with that line in A Storm of Swords is you're followed up with a Jamie Lannister point of view chapter shortly after that and you his reaction to the Red Wedding isn't is not a reaction of, oh my God, I can't believe he did that, because that wouldn't be realistic. Jamie is they're still at war with the Starks. Rob Stark is his enemy. It's not like he changes his character and all of a sudden Rob Stark's not his enemy. It's not like he changes his character and he's more honorable. So he automatically understands Rob Stark's motives and doesn't think of Rob as the enemy. That's not how life works. They're at war with the Starks. Rob Stark will always be his enemy. And even the nature of the Red Wedding, that betrayal and that breaking the law of guest right, it's a heel heel tactic. But Jamie doesn't go, I can't, I'm glad Rob Stark's dead, but I can't believe the way that it happened. He immediately dismisses it. No, he doesn't dismiss it, but he doesn't he doesn't think too deeply into it. He's not surprised by the move because he knows no. his he knows his father, but he's not celebrating the move. As you would think an enemy of Rob Stark would. He is not quite indifferent to it, but he does not think too hard about it in his own head. And I think subtly that's part of his character arc because it is his enemy, but it was a dastardly way to defeat your enemy. He realizes he doesn't have all this control. Without his sword hand, he's not as arrogant. He's not as high on himself as he was. And he's trying to make it mean nothing to him. It has not to do with the journey that he's on in his own head, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. So this guy goes on to write, Turning point was when Jamie was captured and chained up by the Starks, an ordeal that humbled him, humanized him, and eventually left him without a sword hand, struggling to find a new post-Kingslayer identity for himself. Sure, Jamie could still slaughter his own cousin to escape captivity, but he could also rescue Brienne of Tarth from a bear and pledge to return the Stark girls to their mother, Catelyn, and refuse to kill his brother Tyrion on Cersei's behalf, and so on. He was a compromised, conflicted asshole but he was basically trying to do the right thing. And I think that's a pretty good summary, but at least up until that point. It's not night and day. You can't go from being one type of person to another. It's a gradual thing. And things happening to you, experiences you have, are really the only things that can change you. It's not just changing the way you, you think. You can't do that. It, it, it's something that happens to you, an experience you have, something you learn from, something that you see that you did not know. That's what makes you change as a person, if you can change at all. Before we get into his storyline, Elephant in the Room, and we touched on it with Cersei in our last episode, it's the rape scene in season four, the Breaker Chains episode. And I don't think that everyone that watched this show was split down the middle, but it did spark, I guess, a controversy, but at least debate about sexual violence against women. And part of the debate was Jamie's character development. Yeah, they kind of like went through like a 180 on it. Yeah, and you've said that quite a few times. Not just quite a few times for that instance, but quite a few times as there's been quite a few times that he's done a 180. Alyssa Rosenberg, Washington Post, she wrote, what happens next dramatically complicates what they've done to make Jamie a more sympathetic character. Given what we learned of his reasons for killing the king he was sworn to protect, Jamie has experienced profound losses over the the last two seasons, his hand and his identity as a fighter have been taken from him. His son has been murdered, which we'll get into. His father, a toxic commanding man, has returned into Jamie's life. And what Cersei is asking of Jamie is that he remove one of the few remaining things that gives him happiness, the little brother who makes him feel better about his hand from existence. Cersei is asking Jamie to inflict more pain on himself, but his response is not to stop loving her, not to stop believing that he is victim to the gods. Instead, Jamie rapes his sister passing that sense of unendurable pain onto her. He must know that this is the worst possible way that he could hurt her. Jamie knew that Robert raped Cersei. Not only does raping Cersei remind his sister of her repeated humiliating violation, Jamie is poisoning their own relationship, the thing that had been Cersei's antidote to the miseries of her marriage. It is an exceptionally cruel thing for Jamie to do. I understand what this is saying, but that's not in any way accurate. And if she had waited like one more season to write this, she would see that that was not the case with Cersei either. And Nikolai Costa-Waldo has said, if you look closer, there are those moments where she, well, I haven't seen the finished edit, of course, but we tried to have it where she goes into it, then pulls away, then she goes into it, then pulls away. But he is forcing himself. But Lena Headey says they were never directed or intended to film a rape scene. She says some stuff about how bad rape is, and that's not what they were trying to do. I mean, it's still controversial to this day, but I don't think it's much ado about nothing. I think it's great that it sparks debate, but just to avoid getting into it when we get to season four shortly, it's just not accurate. That's not what the scene was. 
And if you knew anything about Jamie and Cersei's relationship, like if you weren't somebody who just started watching Game of Thrones, mm-hmm. you know, and you understood these characters, then you you would know that that's not what it was, and definitely not what Martin intended it for, intended for it to be. And it was definitely in no way a malicious act on Jamie's part to hurt his sister. So it just strikes me as the most vocal people saying they depicted rape are the people that had not been watching the show, had not read these books, and are not very familiar with these characters. They just saw something and said, oh, that's rape. Do you have any thoughts on this, John? I mean, I, I never took it as, as rape. I just took it as just Jamie going backwards a little bit. Okay. I don't know. I, I just always thought that he was – his character, the way they were going with it, was just going to be above this. Mm-hmm. If anything, I, you, I would think that it would, it would have been like Cersei would be more the aggressor, but I just thought he just did like a 180 kind of – in the source material, it's more along the lines of Jamie's been gone for – like they regularly have ancestral sex whenever it's possible for them to, they do. And that's always been their relationship since they were since they were kids, since they went into puberty. Mm-hmm. Jamie had been gone for so long, a captive captured at war, in dungeons, escaped, lost his hand, was captured again, almost died, finally made his way back to King's Landing, and he was going back to get to Cersei. That was his driving force to get back, Cersei. Unfortunately, as it happened, the timelines are a bit different in the book and the show when Jamie gets back to King's Landing. But when he goes to Cersei, as Joffrey's laid out, that's his first that's the first time they're alone. I get the vibe that it's painted more as he hadn't been with her in so long, but also she was in pain having just lost Joffrey, and there was that intimate part of it where he wanted to connect with her and make her feel better also. Mm-hmm. And I think that's how Martin intended it. Benioff and Weiss have to work it in a bit of a different way because Jamie arrives at King's Landing, Joffrey's still alive, and he actually has some scenes with Joffrey. So they have to frame it a little bit differently where Jamie has had opportunity to be with his sister, but I do think that it's also conveyed that it's been a long time since he'd been with his sister, and that was, I mean, obviously not having sex by their son's corpse, but that was the status quo of their relationship for their entire lives. And furthermore, there's the metaphorical sense of it. Joffrey was their son. It's Joffrey Baratheon, but it's Jamie and Cersei's son, incest or not. That's what they put forth into the world. That was their legacy. It's ultimately your legacy is your, is your children. Their child had just died, and here they are. At least one of them is performing an act to create another child. Every day we're dying a little bit, but even in death there is life. It's the circle mm-hmm. of life, and that's that's always how I took it. And rape was never, ever a way that I took it. And I've read these books so many times. And I've I've seen that episode at least two times, if not three times. No, three times I've seen that episode. That's not what I got. You know, this is much ado about nothing ultimately. But I just wanted to get that out of the way because I don't want to harp on it when we get to season four. Mm-hmm. Let's do it. Jamie Lannister season one. Is it a good introduction to Jamie Lannister in Winter is Coming? Well, the first time we see him is what we see him. Well, he's actually one of the first scenes, right? With uh, John Aaron. John Aaron's dead body. Right. But anyway, I think there's things that are being said there between Jamie and Cersei that I don't think you really pick up on, especially if you haven't read the books. Like, if you were just watching that just to watch a TV show, then there's like certain things in there that you don't really catch up on yet. Well, they talk about a memory from the past to establish that they are brother and sister. And then there is an intimacy between them in their conversation, but I, I don't mean that in a like in a sexual way. You know, because the I, I do think the incest at the end of episode one, I, I do think that's meant to be a reveal, like a holy shit. Yeah. Obviously it's incest. But you, you can tell from their initial scene that they're very close and that they're schemers and that they scheme together and I think that's what that first scene is meant to establish, which it does. And it's important to establish that before the big Winterfell entrance of Robert Baratheon because mm-hmm. you kind of need to know who these characters are a bit because a lot more characters are going to be introduced in that scene. So while Winter's Coming may not be super Kingslayer, quote unquote accurate, it is, looking back, it's a great introduction to the Game of Thrones version of Jamie Lannister. It's in the book like this way too, where like, you said, oh, look, there's Jamie Lannister or something like that. So you feel like, this is yeah. a known guy, like this Jamie Lannister guy. Like this, you know, he's a, a no name in the Westeros. He's a rock star. Yeah. I guess that maybe takes the place of, of John's point of view, because in John's point of view, he, he says that line, and I'm talking about in A Game of Thrones, the book, he says that line, 
Jamie Lannister looking the way a king should look. It's not going to be a line of dialogue. He's not going to say, oh, there's Jamie Lannister. He looks like how a king should look. But they want to create that that vibe around Jamie. Is it in Winter is Coming where we have the exchange between Jamie and John, or this, is that King? I think that's King's Road. It's the King's Road, the second episode, yeah. And that was the last Jamie and John see of each other until, yeah, at least on screen. Another key scene in season one is I don't know how key it is, but it is a Benioff and Weiss original joint between <laughs> uh, between Jamie and um, Tyrion. No, uh, Jory, Jory Cassell, outside of Robert's bedroom. And Jory's bringing a message to Robert, and Jamie's like, listen to him. He's got however many girls in there. You know, he does this to mock me. He makes me stand guard when he does this to mock me because his sister is the queen, and, and he's mm-hmm. betraying his marriage. I mean, he's the king. He, he can do whatever he wants, but he's betraying his marriage vows, and he makes Jamie Lannister stand guard, and it is almost diabolical on Robert's part. And I never get the vibe that Robert is that smart where he could even think of something that diabolical. Mm-hmm. But maybe he is. You know, maybe that's just how his mind thinks. Maybe just he's- Just woke up one day. Hey, you know what would be best? Yeah. Now if I really yeah. get the brother involved, stay outside the door and hear it. And it's not like Robert sets the Kingsguard schedule. So it is. It's the Lord Commander's job. That'd be Barristan Selmy's job. And I don't think Barristan Selmy is- <laughs> yeah, I don't think he's, he's not setting. He's not setting. Uh, <laughs> you know, the schedule around when Robert's going to be banging whores in his uh, his royal chambers. But there is definitely, probably, there has to be something to that. Where at least, even on a subconscious level, Robert is purposely flaunting who he is to his wife's brother, knowing that either he betrays his vows as a knight of the king's guard and tells his sister what Robert's doing. Or he doesn't, and it's more of an insult meant for Jamie, but it's an insult to the both of them. We talked about the incest reveal in the Cersei episode, but we didn't really touch too much on Jamie pushing Bran out the window. The things I do for love. Almost nonchalantly just tossing a kid out the window. Yeah. Because at first thing you think, okay, he's not going to do it. Mm-hmm. May shake him down, may intimidate him a little bit. And all of a sudden it's like, ha, boom. But if you think about it more, you understand why he felt he had to do it, even if they intimidated him. That might have just made more trouble for them. If they don't kill the kid, they just know he's a Stark. There's already bad blood between Lannister and Stark. If this kid tells anybody that the queen was having sexual relations with her twin brother, that's a disaster. Yeah. That's the ruin of their house. And I think it's easy to look past that fact. If that got out, if Robert knew that, if anybody knew that. It'd be a disaster for House Lannister. It'd be a disaster. Would it be the end of House Lannister? Maybe. It might be. Robert is the king of Westeros. Who knows what he would do? So at that point, it is, I mean, anything could happen, but it, it does really, looking back on it, knowing everything we know about Robert, everything we know about the relationship between Stark and Lannister, you can understand why Jamie thought it was them or the kid. Right. They, they had to choose, do we still want to be in power or everything's going to be taken away from us? Yeah. If we let this kid live, we're going to die. Robert's going to kill us. When Jamie finds out that Catelyn has, and try not, we won't get too deep into Catelyn's actions, but Catelyn and her citizen's arrest of uh, Tyrion Lannister <laughs> at the end of the crossroads, Jamie hears about that and he thinks with his sword hand first. Tywin also reacts to this news, but Tywin's reaction is better thought out. Jamie's reaction is anger, and he goes after Ned Stark, first and foremost. He gets a bunch of Lannister men-at-arms, and, and he attacks Ned and his retinue in the streets at King's Landing. Outnumbering them, right? By the margin? Yeah. Yeah, they outnumber them. And the sword fight, I understand why Benioff and Weiss chose to do that, but it doesn't work for me, that sword fight. If you go back to Winter's Coming, the exchange Ned and Jamie have, and I like that exchange, but I think they set up the promise of a sword fight between the two of them one day in that exchange. Maybe they felt they had to deliver on that. And they did. They had a sword fight, but I don't think it delivered on what they were advertising. It wasn't that great of a sword fight. It wasn't necessary. Season one, money effects. Yeah. Money budget. We get Benioff and Weiss' original joint, Jamie Lannister with Tywin. And I love that scene. Well, with the- um... He's skinning the deer, the stag. 
Actually, the more I think about it, these Benioff and Weiss original scenes, especially in season one, they're really good. Tywin's talking about the legacy. With House Lannister. And Jamie's doing like the teenage kid thing where he's like half listening, rolling his eyes. He thinks he knows better than his old man. And Tywin's explaining, you got to look at the bigger picture. I'll be dead one day. Your sister, you, all we have is our house, our legacy, you know, what we leave. And that's all that matters is the legacy. Right. And and the bigger metaphor of it is that he's talking about this war that they're now in. Jamie's got to look at the bigger picture. And he's doing this while he's skinning a stag, which is great because the sigil of House Baratheon is the crown stag. It's so subtle. You can tell that it's a deer that he's skinning, but it's not so heavy handed. And it's also great because what happens to Jamie after that, he's kind of rolling his eyes at what his father's saying is he loses a battle and he gets captured by Rob Stark. Right. So as he's saying this, it's like almost right off the bat. Jamie didn't take any of his those words to, to heart. And I think that was part of Tywin's frustration. I guess it's episode 10, Fire and Blood. They have my son. Right, right, right. That loss is, is a tough loss. I'm sure I was Ra Ross, Rob Stark at the time thinking he could beat Tywin in the field, but I don't think there's any doubt in Tywin's mind that despite that loss, he was going to beat Rob Stark. I don't think Tywin ever doubted that. He was just more difficult than he initially thought Rob Stark would be. I think part of that frustration is at Jamie for getting himself caught, for losing that battle, for allowing a green boy to defeat him on the field, to be that surprised by him and to lose his host, which makes more sense to him then sending Tyrion in his place to King's Landing to help rule. Whether he thought he would lose Jamie or not, he was very disappointed in Jamie. Jamie had not been listening to him to use your head more. And I don't think that, forgive the pun, heavy handed the character of Jamie before he loses his hand. The Battle of the Whispering Wood, which we don't see, they ride out and Jamie Lannister is their prisoner. Jamie Lannister challenges Rob to a one on one duel to decide the outcome of this war. How. Who wins that fight? Jamie. <laughs> How quickly does Jamie win that fight, do you think? You think Rob would have given him a good fight? No. In the books, definitely not. In the show, they probably, you would know. Would have beefed up Rob a little bit. Yeah, they would definitely. Because if you think back to Rob, that scene when he saves Bran from the Wildings. You know, and it's all like a fire. Yeah, it's it's was... not him. It's the, it's the dire wolves that save him. It's fine. That's fine. You know, I give it a pass. But they make him out to be a better swordsman than he actually is. It wouldn't be like a few blows and, and Jamie would win, but it's it's a first round knockout. Yeah. Do you think Rob saves face in the way he, he says no? I mean, I, I guess you can say it shows that Rob isn't stupid. Yeah. You know, he even says it, you know, if we have it your way, you'd win. Like <laughs> Yeah, he does yeah, he does say that, right? The only one who doesn't think you'd win is my dumb mom. <laughs> even I know you'd beat me. <laughs> I'll fight him. <laughs> And that's a good comparison between Rob and Jamie. Jamie's father just gave him this whole big lecture about the bigger picture and using your head. He didn't, got caught. Here he is challenging Rob's, I don't want to say he's challenging Rob's masculinity, but for a young kid like Rob. Now, at the time, Jamie, I mean, let's go a book, book version, Jamie. He's what, around 30, 31 at the time? Yeah. He's younger than Ned. He's a generation between. He's double the age of Rob. Rob's like 15 this time. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yes, definitely. Uh, one's a kid, one's a grown man who's yeah. over the King's Guard. Yeah. You know. <laughs> the greatest knight in the realm. It's like, alright, I'll fight you. I'll fight you, Kingslayer. Everybody's like, no! <laughs> no, don't do well, it's it. Like that. it well, it's, but that is also kind of like Rob, not to take with talk about Jamie, but like early on in the, in the book, when Rob's like, I'll kill him all! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Put your sword away. What are you doing? I'll kill them all. (laughs) Yeah, okay. Sure. But I think what Benioff and Weiss, they frame it as Rob has a maturity that Jamie does not. Rob doesn't take that bait. He's like, yeah, no way. I'm not not fighting you because you'd probably win. Let's try and build up Rob Tully at the expense of Jamie Lannister. Jamie does look more foolish, I think, in the TV show than in the books. But that's the visual medium as opposed to what's going on in your head, I think. I don't think it's anything Benioff and Weiss did. So the only other thing I got with season one is... His scene with Catelyn, which that's in season one. That's season, yeah. It's in episode ten. It's it's at the end of a Clash of Kings, but it takes place in episode ten of Game of Thrones, where she confronts him, and no, yeah, it's like part of it. It's the majority of it. There are no men like me. 
just me. I love that Jamie Lannister line. For me, in the books, I do hate him in Game of Thrones because of the things he does. And you don't see him at all in the Clash of Kings. You just hear about his escape attempts. And then that last Catelyn chapter where she frees him, but it's left ambiguous if she frees him or not. His dialogue and the way he acts, the way he looks in that dungeon, the description of the dungeon, his long hair, but he's still so smug and arrogant, confident in himself. You believe him. You believe him that if this guy wasn't in chains, he'd be able to take out the river run guard, all of them, and, and free himself. He's, he's a caged lion. And when Catelyn says, men like you never think about the repercussions of their decisions or whatever the hell she says. And Jamie's like, there are no men like me. There's just me. It didn't sell me on Jamie, obviously, but I didn't realize how intriguing of a character he was. So they take the best parts of that scene and they put it at the end of season one. And I guess their reason for doing so is you got to give Jamie screen time. You have to keep this character fresh because the material they're adapting from, he has a lull here and he's not in a large portion of a Game of Thrones Clash of Kings. It's hard to do that in TV, not have him around. So they kind of spread out what few scenes he has in those first two books between these two seasons. I don't like how it turned out, to be honest with you. Maybe it's just how great I thought that scene was in the book. It can never live up to that. I understand why they did it. But then they have to have another, they have another scene where he frees her then, where she frees him. Yeah, they do. And okay, that's, 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 yeah. okay. I'm, that's what I'm saying. Like yeah. they, they split the parts of that, of that scene, mm-hmm. the dialogue about Bran in particular. She asks him, did you push my son out the window? And, and he says, yes, I did. She says, you wanted to kill him? I rarely push boys out windows, hoping for them to live. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the attempt was there, but the execution, whatever it was, it, the scene just didn't work well for me, at least not to live up to what that scene was in my mind. And that's what we get for Jamie in season one. They try to show some, not some good qualities about him, but they, I keep using the word frame, but that's the best way I could put it. They try to frame him as a main character, even though everything he's done, you hate and you kind of hate him for it. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's why... I don't like the character in the TV show as much as in the book because by not excluding him and having him being the Dungeons of River Run, they have to show him. And those scenes, if they're all in one scene, is a lot more intriguing, but spread out, it's just clunky to me. What were your thoughts on Jamie at the end of season one, on your first viewing? Hated him? Yeah, I think I think there was definitely bigger fresh to fry to hate, but I definitely didn't like him. What did you think the fate of his character would be at the end of season one? Wow. I'm trying to think back. I wonder, for someone who didn't read the books, what they think that character is. I guess I just view them as this, you know, House Last is evil. House Stark is good. So, this guy's going to die. He'll die. I guess I probably thought he was going to die. Yeah. Which I understand. I get that. But like you said, there are bigger fish to fry. There's Tywin. There's Joffrey at King's Landing. There's Cersei. There's all these other things to deal with. Why are they keeping this guy around then? just to have him die in the Battle of the Whispering Wood. You had to have thought there was more to his story. Yeah, I think you're right. I think he will die. But it's, it's not how you probably thought he would die at the end of season one. Right. He's going to die honorably now. He's going to die doing something to redeem the Starks or to redeem someone or, or do something. Mm-hmm. But it, it is an odd character at the end of season one because even before the premiere of season two, you and I went to Oh, actually, was that between two and three? Two and three. Somewhere I saw Jamie Lannister HBO merchandise. There are no men like me, just me. It was like a poster or something. He's marketed as a character that's going to be around, but he's written as an arrogant character who wasn't that smart, and there are bigger fish to fry. So it's it's odd at the end of season one. Season two, it's not very Jamie-centric in season two. He's got that escape attempt. With his cousin, who's not a Frey, I don't think, in this version. They don't really get into the into the Frey Lannister mm-hmm. marriage alliance. Family tree. Right. Yeah. And I get that. That would just confuse things because some Freys are with the Lannisters because of marriage, some Freys are with Rob because whatever. But one thing I don't again, I understand why they had to do it is the idea of Rob bringing Jamie around on his campaign. It's like Stannis going up the ladder first at King's Landing. It doesn't make any strategic sense. It's probably the worst strategic idea if that's your, and we said it many times, that's that's your ace card. That's what you got up your sleeve. 
Mm-hmm. That's your ace card, and you maybe your reasoning is you don't trust him with anyone else, <laughs> but you're bringing around your dumb mom, <laughs> who ends up being the one that actually frees him. <laughs> yeah. Not just that, you're constantly moving him, but you have to protect the fact that you have him. You can't let him escape. You can't let him die. You can't let him get hurt because that will have repercussions. With those three things in mind, if he's if he is your ace card, the last thing you want to do is bring him around on your fucking war campaign because you don't know what will happen. He's more likely to escape if he's traveling around with you on a war campaign. More likely to get hurt and more escape likely to die. And getting this accounted for or something during the the chaos. Too chaotic, dude. Too chaotic to keep a prisoner of noble birth on a war campaign. It's not something that anybody would ever do. I understand why Benioff and Weiss had to do it. How Tully wasn't really established yet. They didn't even cast those characters. And they needed some more scenes with Jamie. The idea of riding in River Run just for Jamie in season two is not, not something they could do. I don't really give it a pass. I think it could have been done better, but... I get the, what they were going for, and I get the challenges they had, and keeping him fresh and relevant in the show is kind of similar to the Theon storyline in season four, mm-hmm. or season three in season four. They had to do something just to keep him around, just to make him relevant, to say, hey, look at me. Mm-hmm. And then that Rob scene with him. Yeah, I, think, I was just going to bring that up, actually. I love that. I love that scene. It's a great scene. What, what do you like best about it? It's the banter between both of them. Yeah. They're both playing off like, they're both like playing off their strengths at the mm-hmm. time. You know, Jamie's arrogant, older, you know, appeal to Rob, and Rob has the strength. And then all of a sudden, you bring Ray Wynn and Bob, where all of a sudden it's like, yeah, here's your strength right here, Jamie Laster. It's like Rob flaunting almost. Yeah. He's showing Rob getting a little bit arrogant while Jamie is, has to deal with his defeat. That's all he has is to keep going over that battle. And that has a big payoff, as we'll see in season seven, is him going over that battle again and again in his, in his mind. Yeah. Uh, Battle of the Whispering Wood. Probably a Benioff and Weiss original. Yeah, well, it is. It definitely is. Talked about him killing his cousin, Alton Lannister, who's also a Benioff and Weiss original joint, this character. He beats him to death and strangles his guard, who is Torn Karstark. So that's how they bring the Rickard Karstark need for revenge storyline into the picture. Torn Karstark's a guard. Jamie strangles him and... He doesn't get very far. He gets captured again. <laughs> and I think Rob is not here when all this happens. Right. He's away. Mm-hmm. And then Catelyn and Brianna Tarth, she doesn't really confront Jamie, but this is the second half, so to speak, of the final com- of her final chapter in The Clash of Kings. Honorable Ned Stark. Right. Yeah. This is where he, he really he's trying to push her buttons by talking about yeah, Ned's so honorable. You know, what do you call the, the bastard he has? He's so honorable. And this is after Catelyn has learned about Bran and Rickon. And, you know, it does make sense to me why she did it. But we've gone over it time and time again. The dumbest thing. Yeah. It really is her crown jewel. Is releasing Jamie. She's going to send him with Bran of Tarth, who she somehow expects to protect him all the way to King's Landing. Such a selfish... And make a successful trade for her daughters and then accompany her daughters back. Yeah, to- somehow back up. Like, <laughs> it's such a far fetched, stupid plan. I mean, did she really even think that Cersei would go for it? Right. She'd just be like, oh, you brought Jamie to me? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, l- let me go just go get the girls. Kill her. <laughs> <laughs> His final scene of season two is with Brienne. They row a boat. She rows the boat to shore and they confront some Stark men who realize he's the King Slayer, she ends up killing them. And she says, I'm not sworn to... House Stark? I'm not sworn to House Stark. So with the Lady Catelyn. Ugh. <laughs> Ugh, God, just kill me, please. Uh, yeah, I didn't like that scene very much. I get it, again. I don't like House I like Lady Catelyn. Ugh, God. Mm. That's just like... <sighs> yeah. Lay, lay the groundwork of me, cannot, not standing for Anatarth. She's not somebody that you want to follow blindly. You only know, Brienne. <laughs> Season three is said by a lot of people to be, I'm sorry, the Jamie story in season three is said by a lot of people to be, next to the Red Wedding, the best part about season three. Mm-hmm. I might agree with that. Again, for me, what was disappointing is his story was like a, a watered down version of his story in the books. 
even his journey with Bran, which I love in the book, part of the reason I like that so much is because his cousin is with them. And the way he speaks to his cousin and thinks about his cousin and his point of view is some real funny stuff and goes a long way to show that he's the same old Jamie. They eliminate that in TV. Anywhere they can take a character out, (laughs) they're going to do it. But the major strokes of the story are the same, except there's no bloody mummers, brave companions. At that point in time before season three aired, I thought Game of Thrones would be able to include characters like that. Obviously, Looking back on it now, there's no way you can write in the Brave Companions and all the characters, evilly interesting characters that are in that group. There's no way you can include that in the TV show. There's too many things that need to mm-hmm. happen. So instead of the Brave Companions, we get Locke. And we don't even know this guy's first name, right? Locke? Or if that's his first name or if Locke's his last name. There is a house Locke in The Song of Ice and Fire. They are a northern house as far as being Banner into the Boltons. It's possible. But this guy, Locke. And his men, they capture Jamie and Brienne after their sword fight, which again, I don't know what you thought of it, but I thought it was rather lackluster. I mean, so far they really haven't done any great one-on-one sword fighting. Yeah, that's a good point. It's more of like the, the big battles. Well, the, their action has actually up to that point been not the focus of anything, really. It's just the Battle of Blackwater was, was the only one that they really put any oomph into, and that didn't mm-hmm. feature any one-on-one sword fight or display of any one man's skills except for Stannis. And then Jamie tries to talk his way out of being Locke's prisoner and Locke responds by chopping his sword hand off. I don't even think Jamie screams. No, he cut- does. Does he? Yeah, he does. yeah. But they cut the black pretty quick after he chops yeah, his hand yeah, off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's not like uh Who he is before who he is after is all about his sword hand. He can't be who he was before. Because that mindset, it's all so shallow and revolves around what he can do with his sword hand, and now that's gone, and he has to be reborn, so to speak. But I did want to mention the line of, kill the boy and let the man be born. When does he say that? Maester Amy says that to John. That's, uh, that's later on. That's Yeah, maybe it's even Dance of Dragons, right? Yeah, that's figuring that's... But I think that's such a, a key line to so many characters especially because many of them are younger when the series starts and have responsibilities later on. Jamie's thinking, he may be a grown-ass man, but his thinking and his character are almost childlike. When he loses his sword hand, he has to be a different person. He has to think a different way and react to things differently because he doesn't have, he was able to live behind. Right. He's got to learn to now, like you always said, he's got to learn to be wrong his father now. Kill him with his wisdom, not with his skill, the sword. Right. And it also goes back then to that scene in season one with his father, when his father's telling him the same thing. You can't be a boy anymore. You got to be a man. It takes Jamie losing his sword hand to become a man. As the seasons progress from there to become the man that he was meant to be or the man that he has to be. They get taken to Harren Hall is where we meet Quyburn. He's a former disgraced maester. He treats Jamie's wound and... Saves Jamie's life, really. While they're at Harren Hall, Jamie reveals to Brienne the reason why he killed Ares. Does he get very in depth in Game of Thrones? He had uh, Brienne say, How come you didn't tell Lord Stark? Right. Are you going to tell me that the Honorable Lord Eddard Stark would listen to me? He had me, you know, whatever he said. By what right? But he says that. But, but what right does the, the wolf judge the lion? Yeah. He's in that hot bath, right? Almost like a baby in a, you know, in the womb, comfortable, hot bath. And he's admitting his reason for doing his most heinous act, what he's known for, an act that he's embraced. It's his badge of honor. He embraces it as a way to like intimidate people or to show people that it doesn't bother him, that they think he's an oath breaker. In that scene, he shows that it does bother him. He doesn't want to be known as the Kingslayer. But at the same time, it's not arrogance, but he's he's confident in the decision he made. He could have explained it. He could have tried to explain it. He would have still been called an oathbreaker because it's not their place to judge the king. That's not what they do. They protect the king no matter what. So even if Ares was going to destroy all the people in King's Landing, you broke your oath. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Doesn't matter. He was going to kill 500,000 people. Doesn't matter. Yeah, protect your king. Yeah, he could have explained it. 
he wouldn't have been punished for it as things worked out, but at least people would know why he did it. Right. Maybe not call him Kingslayer, but he doesn't feel the need to defend what he did. In his mind, he knows what he did was the right thing to do, and that's enough for him. He's like showing signs of rebirth as a new person just by admitting it, but he's also – he shows no remorse. It's not like, nah, Ned, Ned, Ned still would have judged me or like – no matter what, no matter what I said, he would never really listen. But it's not that. Instead, it's like, what right does he have to judge me? He's not worried that he would have still judged him, or people would still call him Kingslayer. It's like you should judge me. Yeah, like what right do you have to judge me? I'm the Lion of Lannister. So it's like a little bit of both there. This new man being born and same old Jamie. It's not the full face turn, but it's obvious then that he's going to do some sort of redemption arc. Bruce lets Jamie return to King's Landing, but he insists on keeping Brienne prisoner. Jamie's like, all right, whatever, keep her. And then he takes off. And then he decides he has to go back for her. Mm-hmm. He goes back and he saves her from the bear pit. And it does also show more growth, just the decision to go back for Brienne. But also, he has the high ground, so to speak, on Locke and his men. And he's with Bruce Bolton's men. He can easily take out Locke, but he chooses. Not to. And he just leaves. And I think that was late in the season. I can't think of anything else that really happens with Jamie in season three, except he returns to King's Landing. And when he returns, he doesn't embrace Cersei. He just- Cersei. Yeah. He said that like that. And they leave it with them looking at each other, yeah. right? Yeah. Look and at he, me. So what'd you think of Jamie at the end of season three? Your feelings on him changed? Did you think he was going to do a full face turn? Where'd you think his character was going? I still don't know. I still can't. I'm trying to think back to how I felt about him then. Honestly, you think he was still more of a non-factor than a, a factor in the bigger scheme of things? Well, no, I think he'd be a factor. I mean, at this point, I didn't think he was going to be a non-factor, but in terms of I liked him, and I don't know if I saw the full redemption arc just yet. Fair enough. We talked about this in the teaser episode. It deserves at least mentioning here, even though we've talked about it before, the Red Wedding episode and the line change from Jamie Lannister sends his regards to House Lannister sends their regards. I think they made the line change mostly because it would confuse the issue of where they wanted to bring the Jamie character. You said that it's a more chilling line for him to say Jamie Lannister sends his regards, and it definitely, without a doubt, is. It wouldn't have helped change the way viewers were thinking of Jamie Lannister if they gave that line, especially for how horrific of an episode The Reigns of Castamere is and how much of a shock that was to viewers who hadn't read A Storm of Swords. Yeah, I just think it just takes away. Yeah. And I guess I see why they did it. They tried to they try to buff his character out a little bit and, and soften him up a little bit. But I just always like I just always like that. I don't think that they even have that line in the Bruce Bolton dinner. I don't think he says, Give Rob Stark my regards. I think they cut that out alt- altogether, I believe. No uh what the show? Yeah. No, no, he uh Jamie says it as they leave as he leaves. He says something to that to that effect. Yeah, like oh, I wish I was there or something. Yeah. You know, he, he he makes mention of it as if he knows what's going to happen. Give Rob Stark my regards. In A Storm of Swords, when he says that line, he doesn't know the Red Wedding's coming. He just knows that Roose Bolton is open to making a deal with Tywin, but it really depends on Jamie not fingering Roose Bolton as responsible for him losing his sword hand. I don't think Roose Bolton and. Tywin Lannister had any direct contact between each other. I think it all went through Fat Walda and Roose's marriage alliance with the phrase. So you don't think that Tywin got in touch with Roose? No, I don't think so. I think he communicated with Roose through Walder. Jamie's safe and sound. I think that probably even post Red Wedding, where he names him Warden of the North. I think in the aftermath of the Red Wedding, which was planned by Roose and Lame Lothar and Black Walder, I think. Then Tywin's in contact with Roos, but Roos had to prove that he was on the side of the crown. Right, 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 right. And he was only able to do that through his alliance with the Freys, who were definitely in contact with Tywin. Anyway, season three, if that's the downfall of House Stark, season four can be looked at as the downfall of House Lannister, and it's one of the few cold opens that we get. Boy, always hated it. Really? I love this. I mean, I, I like but it because- I, like it. I always hate you know the- The cold open? Not the, no, no, that what they did to the sword. Oh, yeah, of course, dude. Tywin Lannister, it's one of the only times that you get a smile or a hint of a smile out mm-hmm. of him in Game of Thrones. 
as it being the cold open for season four, it's the statement like House Lannister has won the War of the Five Kings. It's a celebratory moment for House Lannister. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we finally got our Valyrian steel sword. <laughs> All the things that happened through season four, it doesn't decimate House Lannister to the point of House Stark, but King Joffrey dies, Tywin dies, Tyrion is arrested for Joffrey's murder. Their army is spent from the War of the Five Kings to the point where they need to rely on House Tyrell for their military power. They still have the Iron Throne at the end of season four, but they're diminished in their powers. There's no more Tywin. So Jamie's already back, which is a different timeline from the book. Tywin gives Jamie half of the sword that he got, of the two swords he got from Ice. The other one he gives to mm-hmm. the king. He feels the king should have a weapon of Valyrian steel. And he gives Jamie the other weapon. And Jamie's like, I don't have a sword hand anymore. What do you want me to do with this? Tywin's like, well, learn to fight with your other hand. Pretty stupid thing to say because that's not an easy thing. Yeah. He also asks Jamie to resign from the Kingsguard and to become the heir to Casterly Rock and to even go back to Casterly Rock and rule while Tywin is serving his hand to the king. Now, Tywin thinks he's got everything figured out. Like, this war is over. Now, he's, he's already planning for the future. He's playing, he's playing everything. And I'm sure this was his plan all along. Really? Usually, he's a patient guy. If he doesn't get what he wants in general, he figures out a way to get what he wants. But in this scene, and then later on, and we talked about it in the Cersei episode, his scene with Cersei, they both refuse him what he wants from them. He immediately disowns them. Jamie, he says he disowns because Jamie refuses to resign from the King's Guard and go rule a cast of the rocks. So he's like, You're not my son. That's not very Tywin Lannister like. Mm-hmm. It's childlike. You're not going to do what I want. You're not my son. Get out of here. You're fired. Because what's his backup plan then? Who's going to rule Casterly Rock? He's not Tyrion, obviously. Tyrion offers and he refuses him, even though it's Tyrion's by right. Quyburn makes him a gilded steel hand. Tyrion, who's in jail at the time, arranges for Jamie to have sword lessons with Bronn. I'm sure we'll speak about Bronn when we get to Tyrion. It's obviously Benioff and Weiss' original joint, but it's... <laughs> to have Bronn everywhere. Yeah, it makes so much sense, and it's almost a better decision than what Martin did. In A Song of Ice and Fire, Jamie starts learning to fight with his non-sword hand with Ilm Payne, the royal justice here. I don't know if that actor's dead now. Didn't make an appearance after season two. Did he have a cancer or something? Yeah, he had cancer, and uh, he just couldn't be in the show anymore. So they replace him with Bronn, and it works a lot better. Yeah, well, because he, cause he, he can talk. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, the character of Bronn is so likable, also. And there's a good way to keep him around. Mm-hmm. Who do you think has a better relationship at this point? Are Jamie and Bronn closer than Tyrion and Bronn were? I would think so at this point. At least, definitely, yeah, obviously in the show, definitely. Uh, well, how about along the lines of more entertaining to watch? Tyrion and Bronn in season two or Jamie and Bronn in season five, season six. That's tough. Jamie with without the hand is almost kind of he's not a comedic part, but it takes some of the shit, you know, like mm. it gives Braun opportunities to, to give him, you know, a couple of jabs where Jamie had both his hands. He's not giving him any kind of jabs. That's true. But then there's also the side to it. Jamie knows he can't fight like he used to, so he needs that that right hand man. That can fight, and Bronn obviously can fight very well. It's not a sign of weakness because he, he lost his hand. He can't. He just can't. But he still has his mind, which he's developing in terms of war and ruling. And he's got Bronn as his right hand man who will have to do his fighting. That's just how things go. Tywin's not fighting people. The only lord of Westeros that, that fights is Stannis. And Rob. And Rob, right? We'll see what happens to both of them. I like Bronn replacing Ilm mm-hmm. Payne. He's more of a dynamic. Honestly, I think the chemistry between Jerome Flynn, is Bronn's name? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, and Coster Waldo, I think they have better chemistry than Dinklage and Jerome Flynn. Well, all I can say with it with a 100% confirmation is they have much better chemistry than Jerome Flynn and Lena Headey. <laughs> <laughs> like, you would just say, I... I, I I guess if an actor really does play, you know, it goes out for role and nails it good, I guess you can't say no to him. But, like, didn't you know about the off-the-air, you know, drama between them? 
Oh, this was before he was cast? Yeah, they used to go out. They were like dating. What? Oh, I thought it was like during- No, like, no, 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 uh, not at all. Uh, they were like dating. I'm not sure they were married, but they were dating and they it just, you know, it got ugly. No kidding. So we get to Cersei refusing to resume their relationship. She finally gives in in front of Joffrey's dead body. Jamie decides to give his Valyrian steel sword to Brienne. Also, he gives Tyrion's squire, Podrick, to Brienne. And he tasks Brienne with finding Arya and Sansa, or one or the other, and protect them, take them to safety. That's right up Brienne's alley because she does not fit at court. Jamie can't go out and save them. He has to stay behind. He's still Lord Commander of the King's Guard. Right, 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 right. Jamie does have another conversation with Tywin, and he makes a deal with him. At this point, he's convinced that Tyrion is going to be found guilty, so he tells his father if he spares Tyrion, then he will leave the King's Guard. But Tyrion does not have as much faith in his father. He chooses trial by combat. After, after he loses the trial by combat, Jamie helps him escape. So Jamie does a lot of good guy stuff in season four. Climax being he releases Tyrion from the dungeons. So at the end of season four, are you sold on Jamie as a good guy, or do you still see him as kind of a bad guy? Or how are you looking at Jamie as we go into season five? Opening up, maybe is he still a guy that's still gonna be out for himself, do things that are positive, but will he be out for himself? Okay. So not quite all the way turned yet. He's more of a, uh, a Stone Cold Steve Austin 1997 than a Stone Cold Steve Austin 1999 at this point. Right. Actually, Stone Cold's probably a bad example, but more of a Stone Cold Steve Austin than a Hacksaw Jim Duggan, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Jamie in season five. Cersei's pissed at Jamie for releasing Tyrion. Not only did he release Tyrion, but he released Tyrion and Tyrion killed the father. Obviously, Cersei's pissed at that, but she benefits from her father dying. She no longer has to marry Loras Tyrell, right. and she's got a grasp on her son, who Tywin was purposely keeping away from her because of how poorly a job she did with Joffrey. <clears throat> Jamie tells Bronn that he's going to kill Tyrion the next time they meet, which doesn't happen. And then we get the quite possibly the worst storyline. In Game of Thrones. Yeah, and Sally has to involve Jamie. I'm glad they did make the attempt, though, instead of cutting out Dorne altogether. At least they made the attempt. It just didn't work. A message arrives from Martell's subtly threatening Myrcella, who, if we remember, is there as a ward, part of a, a marriage alliance that Tyrion made with them. But they get a message subtly threatening Myrcella as revenge for Prince Oberyn Martell's death. I don't know what they want from that threat. I guess they just want proof that they weren't responsible for Oberyn Martell's death, but while well, you're threatening something, just kill her, you know? Mm -hmm. What's the even sense? The whole thing kind of doesn't make sense if you look at it. It makes sense in the books because of all the other stuff going on. In the show, not so much because they just go through it too quickly. Jamie and Bronn travel to Dorne in secret to retrieve her. Now, I don't remember. Was this Jamie's decision or was it Cersei's decision for Jamie to go? Uh, Jamie. Because Cersei said, well, if you send people over there, it's going to be like after war. Right. We'll send two guys instead, one with no sword hand. That should work. But it does, sort of. Almost. We have an okay fight scene with no stakes, and then we have a couple of shitty scenes in Dorne. Ultimately, we do get a very nice scene between Jamie and Princess Marcella, in which Jamie tries to tell Marcella the truth that he is her father. And Marcella says that she knows. No, sh She's a no shit, Jan, Dad. <laughs> yeah. I've always known. Does she say anything like she accepted that because look at Robert? <laughs> didn't want him for my father? No, she didn't. No, no, didn't, didn't like go that, that far. Yeah. I tried. I didn't go that far. That'd be nice, though. She wants them both to be happy, and she's glad they love each other. And Jamie has a moment of, all right, I can, I can do this. We can admit this. I can love Cersei openly. If Marcella accepts it, if she accepts that she's my daughter, I have a daughter now also. And I can tell Tommen. And Joffrey's dead. You know, the one that probably wouldn't like it. He's out of the picture. But that feeling is short-lived. 
she pretty much drops dead right away. Yeah, typical, typical, typical fashion. Yeah, they share a brief embrace before she suddenly collapses and dies, having been poisoned by Ilaria Sand. But Jamie doesn't turn the boat around. He keeps he keeps going back to King's Landing. Well, he can't he can't turn the boat around. He turns the boat around. He, who's behind all this? We're all, we're outnumbered like you wouldn't believe. And I'm sure he thought about it on the way back. If they wanted to kill Marcella. Why didn't they just kill him also? So I mean, he must have figured it wasn't Prince Oberyn, but somebody with their own. What's the word I'm looking for? Agenda. Agenda. Yeah. Somebody with their own agenda. And maybe he did think of that. Maybe he didn't think of that. But he's sailing between season five and six. He's on the water. Were you expecting her to die there? Or did you think that she was going to come on to Cersei? It's a good question. It's a good question. I don't know. It was uncharted territory right. as far as the book goes. Well, I was a little surprised, but I wasn't shocked. I don't ever think I pictured Tom and Marcella being in mortal danger reading the books. So I guess I just expected the same in the TV show. Mm-hmm. It makes more sense the farther away from that episode we get and the more the storyline progresses, it does make more sense. But I think, I think it was said, I think I said when it happened because I really liked that scene that they had together and what it meant for Jamie's character. Mm -hmm. And then it all just gets taken away. So Jamie season six, he returns to King's Landing with Marcella's corpse, but does not have sex with Cersei while it's lying out. (laughs) First time was a little too much. Gonna back off. Oh, I forgot this. He had Tristine was on the boat too, right? No, he was on a different boat. What? Yeah, uh, yeah, he was on a different boat. So what? What the hell happens to him, Tristine? Get to kill, they I- kill him. They kill him. Who does? The sand snakes. They poison him also, or no? They stab them through the friggin' right through the, the back of the mouth. When I'm trying, I'm trying to see. Same episode, I think. Right, same episode. Is it at King's Landing when they kill him, or? That was one of those weird, like, timey things. Like a little finger subway back to Dorne? Because he, he dies in Dorne, right? They, it's got to be at King's Landing. I think it's at King's Landing because the Sand Snakes are there when she's poisoned with their mother. And then, like, the next thing you know, you see Tristan, Tristane. Right. And that's when they kill uh, Okay. Him. They must have yeah, kept, that, that. somehow they, yeah, it was one of those weird Ben up and Weiss he took a portal, like, okay, they yeah, took a boat yeah. to catch up to him somehow and got into the same boat. It's one of those deals. Okay. Because Jamie orders Tristane to stay on the boat to protect him from Cersei's wrath. And then Cersei must say something like, send him back to Dorne. I don't want him here. So they send him back to Dorne and then- Yeah, something like that, yeah. Okay. Either way, kind of just neatly wraps up the whole Dorne thing. Yeah. You to come back into play later on with Daenerys, but- at that point, fuck cares. At Marcella's funeral, Jamie confronts the High Sparrow, the new High Sparrow, for having forced Cersei to walk naked through the streets of King's Landing. But he's forced to stand down as the Faith Militant arrives. He then enlists the Tyrell army to march on the Sept of Baylor to secure the release of Marjorie and Loras Tyrell. And this is Cersei's plan. But they find that Marjorie has become a follower of the High Sparrow. And that Tommen has forged an alliance with the Faith Milton. Tommen then punishes Jamie for taking up arms against the Faith. He's removed from the King's Guard. <laughs> Tommen with a little power play here. Yeah. Give this inner Joffrey. And it's Tommen that decides Jamie should go to River Run with Bronn to help mm-hmm. House Frey and their siege on River Run, which is under the control of <laughs> Brendan Blackfish Tully, who escaped the Red Wedding while he was using the bathroom. I don't know about you, but every time I have a bad battle, it always happens at the most inopportune time. So the black fish, it comes at the most opportune time. Oh, dude, he's the luckiest pooper in the history of Westeros. <laughs> it's so weird, though, because the vibe you get from his character is he would have tried to save Catelyn during the Red Wedding. Like, instead, he just mm-hmm. escapes or, like, was his poop that long where, like, he, he goes back and, and, like, everybody's already dead. He's like, uh, oh. They're not real clear on it. And it's just a line in passing, like, he escaped through the bathroom, or he escaped while he was going to the privy. Either way, he escaped, and he got back to River Run. Jamie marches, helps with the siege. One of my favorite chapters in A Feast for Crows is the parlay between mm-hmm. Blackfish and Jamie. This is where I think I was, like, starting to like him. He's trying to not bear arms against House Tully, which was one of the promises he made to Catelyn. Mm-hmm. 
it forces him to think more like his father. He even makes a threat like his father. And we get a character we haven't seen in a couple seasons, Ed Muir Tully, <laughs> the best of the Tully family. Well, <laughs> it's not really going off on a limb on that. The parlay fails, but Brienne arrives. Why was Brienne coming to the River Run? Try to get... Uh... Oh, to get them to help take Winterfell. Yeah. Okay. Eh, a little clunky, but all right. Brienne arrives, and she beseeches Jaime to end the siege without bloodshed so the Tully rebels can help Sansa Stark retake Winterfell. So she's like, she's like, all right, listen, I know you got to take River Run, but can you hold off on that? Let them march up to the north to take Winterfell and then come back and then continue the siege? And Jamie's like, no. Jamie manipulates the captured Edmure Tully into thinking his infant son will be killed if Edmure does not order a surrender. He releases Edmure. Edmure goes into the castle and he opens the gates to the Lannisters. Much to the chagrin of the mm-hmm. Blackfish. He dies off screen, right? Yeah, you don't see it, yeah. Jamie sees Brienne and Podrick fleeing by boat from the castle walls, and he waves a discreet farewell so the Lannister men don't notice. There's two more scenes, what I can remember with Jamie in season six, the first being at the Twins, celebrating their victory. I don't know why, John, but I had the worst feeling that that Jamie was going to get killed by that, Arya in that episode. You, yeah, right. You knew that was Arya. Yeah, I knew it was Arya. Had to be Arya. She doesn't kill him. I don't know why. Right. You thought that, you think that she would, knowing that he's a Lannister. And it's not even like she's not capable of it. Jamie leaves right before House Stark is destroyed. House Frey. House Frey, yeah. It's House Stark. He leaves right before House Frey is destroyed by one young girl. When he gets back, he sees what Cersei's been up to. And what has Cersei been up to while he's gone? Taking shit over. Except the Baylor is burned and the surrounding area of the city. He arrives just in time to see Cersei crowned as Queen of the Seven Kingdoms. Great acting by Nikolai Costa-Waldo and Lena Headey, just in the look they give each other. Mm -hmm. What the hell did you just do? Mm -hmm. Plus, that's why he killed the Mad King all those years ago. The Mad King was going to burn the city. And he also knows that Tommen's dead because why she put the crown on. Mm -hmm. And he's got to convey his initial feelings about that in a look. And I think he does a good job with that. Mm -hmm. Season six is probably my favorite or second favorite season. I did like some of the Jamie Lannister stuff in it, but I think it's I think it's because of Dorne that his storyline is a little bit kabuki-ish. It's it seems all over the place because of where he travels to and how quickly he gets there and back and then somewhere else and back. Yeah, then back in season six, he's back into And it's almost like I think we've talked about this before, that final part of his face turn, so to speak, it's in like a, a holding pattern. For season five and six, and most of season seven, he doesn't go all the way with it because of Cersei, sure, but I think also because of where the plot adaptation needs him to be. It like gets put on hold. You originally sold me on this idea that goes back and forth so many times in these later seasons. Do you think this is one of those examples? Like, what did you think he was going to do? Well, I was just, I was, I was waiting from the time of the books. I was waiting for them to do something with him. Saying no to Cersei. And it just never seemed to happen. It always just seems it always still comes back to Cersei. Like she's the bad drug in his life. Every time he tries to do something positive or try to go and make that baby face turn, mm-hmm. he always goes back to her and takes a step back. In the show, do you think this is because of how Benioff and Weiss want to write the character, how they want his journey to be, or do you think it's more because of where they need the overall plot to be? Because he's a victim of it, I think. I think yeah. he's a victim of where they need I the think plot we, to be. I think the latter. I think the latter. I think this is just where they needed to go. At the sacrifice of doing some Leah Dama. Mm-hmm. We don't yeah. know what we're doing with him just yet. Every episode, we seem to make things up as we go. Do you think they do an okay job of finding a medium between the two? Jamie's continued character development and where he needs to be for the plot. In other words, does it work for you? It doesn't ruin my, you know, it's, I'm not going to be like, oh, God, this sucks. Mm-hmm. It, it's not taking anything away from what I feel, you know, but, you know, especially now after we get to season seven, where we actually finally get, we actually finally get to that point where he's like, I'm out. Yeah, it's overdue. But to begin season seven, we still get Jamie loyal to Cersei. Daenerys Targaryen, her forces are sailing on Westeros. 
Cersei agrees to marry Euron Greyjoy after the war against Daenerys is won, but she continues her relationship with Jaime. She no longer makes any attempt to hide their intimacy from their servants. I like this scene. Jaime negotiates with Randall Tarly to get them on the side of House Lannister with the help of House Tarly's forces. Very good scene. Love that scene. It works so well because it's such a far callback and it shows part of his character arc, at least the part where he's using his head now. He learned from that defeat in the Whispering Wood and he used the same, sort of the same tactic to take High Garden. Mm-hmm. And that's a big moment for Jamie. Much like he had that big moment with Princess Marcella, the rug gets pulled out from underneath him. Whereas in that scene, Princess Marcella dies right away. In this scene, at, at the moment of what's his greatest military victory, Olena Terrell confesses that she was responsible for Joffrey's death. This is after he already gave her poison for a, a mercy killing. Yeah, you know, all the things he could have done to kill her. Yeah. That's probably what he was thinking as she said that. And as she slipped off into a painless death, he's like, damn it. Does He does end up telling Cersei that, right? Yes. Because I, I believe it's because he's trying one last time to get him off of the I want to kill Tyrion. Right. Yeah, exactly. Tyrion didn't kill your son. And you know what? That plays also then into the scene with Cersei and Tyrion at the end of The Dragon and the Wolf. Cersei knows that Tyrion didn't kill Joffrey, but she doesn't tell Tyrion she continues to use leverage. Yeah, she yeah she continues to use it as leverage, as Lannister forces and Tyrell forces, Tarly forces, excuse me, Tarly forces, are returning to King's Landing with all the High Garden loot. They're attacked by Daenerys on the back of Drogon, and we finally get to see the Dothraki screamers in Westeros. People have said this is one of the best episodes. It is not for me. I don't know. You know that's. They love that episode. I don't know why, dude. I don't know why. The first three episodes of that season were way better than this episode. And the battle was great visually, but it was the most unrealistic of any of the battles thus far. That includes a battle where Stannis, the king, is the first up the ladder with no helmet. Well, especially when you had Jimmy in war with all that armor on, plus his golden hand, and it doesn't die. Yeah, he doesn't, doesn't drown. drown. It's like, what? But I did think for a moment that was it for Jamie. When he was riding towards Daenerys. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, that's it for Bronn at some point too, but they both survive. I feel like they wimped out with that episode. Not that Jaime should have died, but Bronn should have been killed in that episode. I don't know how much bigger of a role he can possibly play in this series. But that would have been a hero's death. Not a hero's death, but a good way for him to go out. And that would have really raised the stakes. But nothing happens really. Instead, the Tarleys die. Not to mention the logistics of what Jamie was trying to do and what Bronn does. And come on, it's fantasy, but you got to base it in reality. Mm-hmm. Take your son to work day. <laughs> yeah. Kill me also. <laughs> Worst. Take your son to work day ever. Jamie and Bronn fall into the Blackwater Rush. They survive the battle by being carried downstream and away from the carnage. So he returns to King's Landing. And somehow they still have enough gold to pay off the Iron Bank. Mm-hmm. But he warns Cersei the Lannisters are doomed. If the conflict escalates any further because of the dragons and the dragons are like worse than they initially thought. Bronn takes Jamie to the Red Keep under the pretense of training him, but it's a ruse to allow Tyrion to speak with Jamie. What did you think? Did you think this scene was a good reunion of sorts? Yeah, I liked it. Because they all the emotions pretty much gone. Like, no, no one's gonna kill each other like there, you know. If nothing else, and I I did like season seven, but if nothing else, I think all of the reunions in season seven were spot on. They were all what I wanted them to be. Mm-hmm. So I'm really looking forward to the, the season eight reunions. Yeah, there's only one that matters. John and Arya? Mm-hmm. Bran and Jamie. Bran and Jamie. Bran and Jamie. Uh, John and Jamie. Sansa and Cersei. I don't think you get that unless... I don't, I don't think... I don't know. Well, I didn't think we'd get the mountain and the hound either, but... Listen, dude, it's not a question of uh, logistics anymore. Winterfell to King's Landing in half an hour. Tyrion suggests a ceasefire so they can team up and fight the White Walkers. He proposes a meeting between Daenerys and Cersei so they can present evidence of the existence of the White Walkers. He convinces Jaime somehow, who tells Cersei. Cersei's skeptical. She already knows, though. Doesn't she already know that he betrayed her by seeing him? Yeah, he knows. She knows. Oh, yeah, she knows that. But as far as the threat of the White Walkers, she's skeptical of that. Mm Mm-hmm. And she reveals that she's pregnant with Jamie's child. 
And then we have the meeting in the dragon pit. Jamie's convinced immediately of the White Walkers. Jamie is, he's almost excited at the idea of Mm -hmm. going to fight these things with the rest of the kingdom. Because this is exactly what he's been looking for his whole life, in a way. Especially since he lost his hand. Lost a sense of who he is, who he was. This is a fight against a true evil. It's unquestionably the good fight. And he can really commit himself to it, doing the right thing. And he's all about it. But Cersei has other plans. What are Cersei's plans? Get the Golden Company through Euron. Right. I mean, she's just absolutely nuts. So tell me, what do you think of that last, the last scene we have of Jamie and Cersei? I love it. Love it. You're going to have him kill me? Calling Cersei out on her bullshit. Whatever we get from Jamie in season eight, I think we get more moments. I don't think he's going to die in episode one or episode two. Mm-hmm. I think he'll get to further redeem himself. I think he will have a meeting with Bran and there will be some dialogue and he will express regret. But regardless of all that, I think that moment when he makes the decision to walk away from Cersei, when he calls her out on her threat to kill him. There's no turning back. That finally completes not his redemption arc, but his arc from black and white villain that we meet at the beginning of season one to hero, to a man that truly wants to do the right thing. And now he knows what that right thing is. And it was a long time coming, but we got there. So is that scene what finally sold you on Jamie Lannister? Definitely. Love the music, love, you know, him not getting like scared with the mouth and like, you know what? All right. He's going to kill me, kill me. All about you know, he was giving out the instructions to come, how to come up north and when to come up north. Like he's all, he's all in on this. This is, as you, as you just said, like this is his moment now. This is where, you know. It's like finally something's come into his life that it makes perfect sense. As horrible as it is, the danger that they're in, he knows what to do in this situation. That's why he's so surprised that Cersei is planning to not involve herself, that she's lying. Jamie in season one probably would have been right there with her. Mm -hmm. we finally see clearly how much this man has changed, even though it was slow going in some parts. Very rewarding. That and the high garden scene Mm -hmm. are the night and day difference between Jamie and his character in season one and his failure in the whispering wood. Is this the most complete arc we have in the entire show of all the characters? Well, it's not complete. But it's getting it's getting there, yeah. I would say it's complete in terms of his way of thinking, but yeah, he still has more to do for redemption, which is the most important part. But I can't think of any other character that's gone through that much change. Maybe Sansa. She's gone through, obviously, a lot of change. Arya also to a certain degree, but I don't think anybody more so than Jamie, A character that does things as despicable as he did, who you can easily toss aside as... He's just an evil guy. He's just a bad guy. He deserves to die. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know what? He still does. Narrative justice does still state that he deserves to die. But nobody, I promise you, nobody that watches the show wants him to die. There's nobody that watches the show that isn't going to be rooting for Jamie in season eight. This is the guy who, in episode one, pushed the kid out the window. (laughs) And obviously, good on George Martin for writing the character, but good on Benioff and Weiss for taking the, the step that Martin hasn't taken yet. We'll talk about what we expect from Jamie Lannister in Season 8 when we do a full-on final final roundup Season 8 preview. Do you have anything else to comment about Jamie? I still just, I can't wait. I I just want to see what he does with Jon. That that handshake's always bothered me. In a good way. Mostly in a good way. Is there no doubt in your mind that they'll call back to that and follow up with it? Definitely, they have to. That handshake, it's almost as if they want to put the camera on a a zoom Mm -hmm. in. They, they, they couldn't because it just would be so stupid of a shot, but it's almost as if like we have to you know really make this handshake known. I think it's known enough. Do you think they repeat the handshake, but John like goes to shake his gilded steel hand? <laughs> now, every single character, I'm, I'm excited to see what they do in season eight, but Jamie's probably right up there with John and, and uh, Tyrion. So, who is up next, John? Who are we doing next time? Well, I guess it's going to, well... We got to go through those uh, Tully kids. Maybe you want to get them out of the way? Yeah, I guess so. We'll do Bran next. Unless you want to do Sansa next. Uh, 
Let's do Brand since we just did Jamie. We can jump off that. So we could go Brand, then Sansa, Arya, and then the big three. Or maybe Arya break up Brand and Sansa so we have a character we are more invested in. Either way, Brand will Brand Stark will be next. Tall and lanky Brand Stark. Thank you for listening. We appreciate it. You can find us on Apple Podcasts. You can find us in the Google Play Store, Stitcher. We're on SoundCloud, YouTube, Spotify. Wherever you find us, please rate and review our show. Remember to subscribe. Tell a family member. Tell a friend. We're on social media, facebook.com slash The Promised Princes. Follow us on Twitter at Princess Promised. Read the Westerosi Companion at theprincesthatwerepromised.com. We will speak with you guys next time. Bum, 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 b